first, my name is Shannon Brown, and then we'll go down kind of the panel and talk about a little bit about why we are here. Um, I am the global head of solutions engineering at Carrot. You see us over there. I'm not here to pitch you on Carrot, I promise. Um, but I do have a very cool job. So what Carrot does is we conduct technical interviews uh, for companies like Intuit, uh, Indeed, and some folks in here. Uh, and my team is a little bit unique. We actually get to work with teams and help them make data-driven decisions around the interview process itself. So it's really easy to get funnel metrics from end to end, but the actual interview, as we all know, actually how many people in here even like doing interviews? All right, you can come work for CARE. <laughs> Good. Um, so, uh, you know, I think they're having me here today because having kind of, you know, predictability and a standard experience across multiple locations is really important, which is an incredible segue into why the rest of the team is here. So tonight we are talking about managing and hiring distributed teams. So please, Kaz, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Kaz. I lead engineering here at Brex. Um, for those of you not familiar with Brex, other than our billboard business, um, we actually build financial services for uh, growing companies. Um, sorry, with a card and our cash account as well. Um, been at Brex for a bit over a year. Um, during that time, um, went from just having an office in San Francisco to now Vancouver, New York, and Salt Lake City. Um, and then prior to that was at Stripe for about four and a half years, where I helped build their distributed offices in uh, Seattle, Dublin, and Singapore. Um, and prior to that at Microsoft, where I learned how not to do distributed engineering. Thank you, Erica. Uh, on that note, um, <laughs> my name is Erica Cato. Uh, I'm the senior engineering manager at GitHub. Uh, I manage a team um, of partner engineers. Uh, we work with our strategic partners um, in our integrations with GitHub. And Abhishek, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Abhishek. Uh, I work at Twilio. It's been almost a year. Twilio is growing. We have 22 global offices, and uh, I have teams split in San Francisco, uh, Redwood City, Denver, and now we are going Madrid and India. I have, um, in, a, in the last five companies, I have distributed teams, as that's where the world is growing. So uh, happy to answer any questions or more uh, learn from all of you. Awesome, so I really wanted to have, give everyone the opportunity to introduce themselves, but also to talk a little bit about how you built your distributed teams, maybe a minute or two on that, each of you, and then we'll go into deeper questions. Sound good? Okay, Kas. Um, so at Brex, the way we kind of approached it is kind of separating remote versus distributed. So my general philosophy is, I think if you have distributed teams and offices, you basically have teams that are located and co-located in different areas. Um, we actually started with Vancouver first, um, mostly as a way to learn how to actually be a distributed company, how to communicate distributed, how to make decisions in a distributed way. Um, we chose Vancouver for a few different reasons. One, same time zone, super easy flight, like it's very easy to do trips back and forth. It's like the easiest place other than like maybe like Seattle or if you wanna go in South Bay. Um, and for us also, it's a very good place where we can help international people um, because the founders really, really care about that. Um, we then open up Salt Lake City, so we started adding like a little bit of a time zone and started adding more functions. So outside of engineering, we now have sales, operations, support. Um, and then finally in the fall, we open up New York City. Um, New York City for financial tech companies, it's like the financial services place of the world. Um, so it makes perfect sense. Um, and it's going to be like our second largest office um, in the first available future. And we have basically teams from all over the company in those offices. Um, GitHub is a remote first company, so um, more than two thirds of the employees are actually uh, remote. So uh, we're definitely distributed and we hire from around the world. I don't think there's any um, uh, preference as to where people live, um, unless there's, you know, you're in a position that requires that you're in a certain location, but most of the positions do not require that. Um, some of my team members live in Europe. Um, and uh, in the hiring process, though, we do sort of screen for the ability to work well with others, um, being able to work asynchronously. Um, so communication is very important. Um, 
At Twilio, we follow, uh, follow the Sun model, where we're trying to build the engineering team in every one third of the world. Uh, the reason is the product we sell have to be fine and reliable, where Twilio, our 180,000 customers trust us with the communication as you're trying to take Lyft, Uber, all the communication platform is built on Twilio. So uh, scalability, reliability of the product is very important, and that's how we try to design our teams. Uh, also, uh, diversity and uh, is very important, how we get the talent in different markets, and uh, specifically, you know, uh, a, we have some goals on uh, female versus male gender in our engineering teams. Um, other than, and, and the third is uh, we do some acquisitions, which are very specific to, for example, in machine learning and natural language processing or IoT. And uh, sometimes when we make the acquisitions, then become a target, like go and open an office across a company which we just acquired. Um, yeah. Awesome. So uh, I was watching some of the responses on people in the audience. And we actually recently did a study uh, that uh, with about 250 engineering leaders. And it showed that um, distributed teams is far more important to CTOs than their actual managers. And so I was wondering for the crew out here, there, there are some CTOs, but there's also a lot of folks who are maybe new to management or they're a little bit misaligned with their CTO on the distributed teams and they're trying to understand like, you know, what advice could you give them to kind of get in line and understand why distributed teams, you know, happen and what can they do to kind of help their CTO out? Kas? Yeah, so I think <clears throat> the way I look at it is I think there's short term versus long term optimizations. So if you're a manager and you're trying to optimize for like how do I build something, how do I grow my team immediately? Saying like all of a sudden you have to have like a distributed team uh, makes it much, much harder for you. It's inarguable that that much harder. Whereas if you tend to think, like if you're the CTO in the company, you tend to think longer term, how do I help scale this company over many years um, and set it up for success long term? And so your incentives are better aligned with that. Um, the thing that I found interesting, um, both especially uh, primarily at Stripe where we started having like remote folks uh, and started moving more teams distributed is you end up having your teams be able to grow faster once you start opening the funnel to remote people because you just have a larger funnel. Uh, and that creates incentives for managers to want to start taking on more remote people. My general rule is you have to commit to at least 30% of your team being remote. So you can't just have like one single person being remote. That makes it really, really hard for your team to operate in a remote um, kind of distributed capacity. But if you actually have it where like at least a third of your team is remote, you stop having like people just like always having events locally. Uh, they start working and collaborating remotely. Like you basically it doesn't matter where people are. Uh, and you can obviously go all the way on the spectrum. Um, but I think those two things are really important, which is like align some sort of incentives for managers so they feel that there's a value for them having uh, distributed people rather than just be forced. Uh, and number two, um, kind of like help them as they build their teams to make sure that you have a sustainable number of people that are distributed rather than just everybody in a single office. That's great. And how would you suggest for the folks out here who aren't CTOs kind of you know, have that conversation with their leadership team if they are looking to go remote and they have questions about it? I mean, my general philosophy at Brex, we're very direct people, and so go talk to them um, and kind of uh, figure out how they're thinking about it. I think there's two things. So either your CTO wants to do it and you don't, in which case you should start thinking a little bit longer term, uh, or you want to do it and maybe your CTO hasn't thought about that, in which case I think that shows like really good leadership because you're thinking about how that company will scale longer term. Uh, and the worst thing that can happen is they'll be like, no, we're not ready for it, or how does that fit in a larger company? But if you actually uh, like go over the arguments, like most people, especially nowadays, like more and more companies are moving to like being distributed, having remote people. Um, I actually, that's really good thought leadership from your perspective uh, when you talk to those folks. And Abhishek, I saw your head going up and down. What's going on? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, uh, as in uh, with every problem in the engineering, going distributed decision is, you know, it's a conversation. So write it down in the document. How are you going to split the teams? What kind of product which is going out? Uh, what is the success metrics? Uh, and that's, if you write it down, it will bring more clear alignment with your leadership, what, what is your picture, what they expect, and how they're looking at it. Because sometimes people are like, oh, just, we just want to hire one engineer in Madrid and the rest of the team is here. That won't make, uh, may not make any sense with the culture you are living. So write it down. Uh, there are multiple options, how to go remote, how to go distributed. I agree with uh, cause that that's the future. That's where we are going from the operations, scalability, and diversity standpoint. 
but the execution, the devils are in the details, so write it down and have a discussion. Erica, did you want to add? Yeah, uh, I think I totally agree with you. Um, there's uh, um, some preparation that needs to be done. Um, my previous work, um, I worked at a Sony PlayStation where uh, we were distributed, but uh, it was a little bit limited to like specific offices because we had to use certain hardware um, that was very expensive. Not everyone could have them at their house. So um, I, there were some limitations there as well as, and because of that, uh, there was some sort of um, uh, habit that we had that we were all together. And so we were not as good in documentation and, and preparing people to like on board for various projects, et cetera. We, we were expected that we need to be there. So there's some preparation that should be done, such as documentation. Actually, Erica, that's a really good segue. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you handle some of the leadership responsibilities, um, and especially since you've been at PlayStation, that have kind of relied on in-person communication. Like, how do you continue to build your culture, and how do you do performance, you know, management and measurement? Uh, I think definitely uh, I read a lot of books on soft skills when I first became a manager because I was also an engineer. And I was not really that good with communication. I just like, just like, head, you know, head down and like work in front of the computer all the time. Sorry, I'm like all sweaty now. See, I, I'm still a little bit of an introvert here. So uh, basically, I mean, I read a lot of books on communication, on like um, having these difficult talks. And so picking a medium uh, when you do have a distributed team. Um, when to sort of, when is it okay to communicate via Slack? When is it okay to like send an email? But when is it critical that you, you talk to them through Zoom or video conferencing? So I think it's very important to know when to do those things and then also to ensure that there's some face-to-face -face time. Uh, we tend to do that maybe once or twice a quarter to meet with a team to sort of build that relationship within the team. Avishak, did you want to jump in? Uh, great answer, by the way. <laughs> Plus one, I, I was a uh, lot of books. Uh, I think management, we need to be in a mindset that we as managers are privileged. Management should be servant leadership. Once you get into the mindset, if the if your team members are 12 hours apart, you still find ways to help them out, where uh, you, you make a point that they travel once in a while, where you found a personal relationship, where you create a test, where if you're on the Zoom call, they feel, you know, so they feel the psychological safety to talk about different issues can be a, you know, underlying issue. So it's, it goes back to the management, why you are a manager why you should feel privileged, what are your philosophies on the management, and then work backwards, what are the different ways which work for the individual, what are the different ways which work for your organization. Uh, at Twilio, of course, we, uh, I uh, care a lot about trust, so basically we bring the whole team together once in three months. Uh, you know, we do the whole week of off-site activities, hackathon, spend a lot of time together, and I, as a leader, try to make a point to basically go and visit them. The, the whole fundamental is build the trust so that they can come to me, feel comfortable, and can tell me this is what I need help in, even on the Zoom call. I have a couple more. Sorry. I, I have a couple more uh, advice uh, for distributed teams. Um, one is, well, communication is very important, but I realize to motivate um, the, the team members, uh, it's always important to explain the why. Like, if it's a project, you know, why are we doing this? And so that, that brings upon, um, I think, motivation. And uh, the other thing, I cannot remember now. <laughs> no, actually, right. how many people here work remotely? How many people out of those would say that motivation is a problem sometimes? Yeah. No. Oh, you're all great. OK, well, I can, I can go home. No. <laughs> I just remembered. The other thing is uh, when you are having a difficult conversation uh, with remote teammates, uh, compliment sandwiches are always really oh, good. Nice. <laughs> the Oreo approach. <laughs> <laughs> so I think 
I just want to stay with Abhishek for a second. Um, what's the single best thing about having a distributed team, and why should companies do it, or when should they not? Oh, uh, for the for the companies or for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would say for you first, right? We're all people here. Well, I get to work with different like. Oh, I get to know and work with the people across the world is that's the biggest blessing. I mean, frankly, that's the reason I'm sitting here as part of the plateau. I was uh, telling to Kwon, like, I get to know people in, on the platform. Some people work for church, some people work for other companies, and that's the same for the distributed, right? Uh, as I'm telling you, the teams in Madrid, India, uh, Singapore, China, just get to know different cultures, work with them. That's for me is a blessing, actually. Uh, for companies, as we talk about the obvious reasons, uh, follow the sun model, or you know, you want to go and hire the talent at the right place. That's for me. Yes. Yeah, I think personally, uh, plus one to that, I like working with people across various kind of like cultures and backgrounds. It's fascinating. Um, like for me, I've kind of always worked in a very international community. Um, I would say for an addition to that, traveling is really fun to those places. Like you have a good excuse to go travel. Uh, I've gone to see places that I probably wouldn't have gone on normal like vacation time, uh, which is really, really useful because you get to experiment it, uh, experience it. Um, I would say for the company, um, there's, I mean, ultimately it's like, you're not gonna find the best people only in one city in the world, uh, as great as San Francisco may or may not be. Um, you have to go and expand from that. Um, and companies will be driven by different things. Like part of it could be growth, part of it could be profiles, part of it could be I follow the sun, a particular expertise, cost, uh, whatever those things are. There's like typically a lot of things that are all tied to the people in those regions. Um, you also tend to have not just engineering, but most companies end up having other kind of functions that have to be distributed. Like it's really hard to do go to market, for example, if you don't have people on the ground. And so typically companies already invest in infrastructure and communications and kind of the workplace to be able to be distributed. Um, so adding engineering to that actually is like incremental cost to the company. Yeah, just to add on that, that's a good point. Um, understand the customer. So one of us, uh, one of the main reasons why we want to basically open a major development center back in Bangalore is to serve the Asian market, stay close to the customer, understand their problem. Um, I can't just sit in San Francisco and claim to solve all the world problems. You need to go travel, understand, so. And I, I want to, we brought up a few pieces like tools and kind of some methodologies, but someone specifically wrote in and asked, what tools would you suggest that they use if you have distributed Scrum, for example? Maybe we'll go down the line on that one. You too. <laughs> <laughs> we do actually use GitHub quite a bit with issues uh, and now Project Board. Thank you. But uh, <laughs> uh, we use um, Slack quite a bit, um, as well as Slack apps. For example, we use Geekbop for daily standups, um, and so that people can sort of do their standups at in their own time zone. I mean, the obvious ones, uh, there's like GitHub, Slack, email. We actually use Threads uh, for a lot of communication, Jira for project management. Um, And you can build your custom communication on Twilio any day. <laughs> Shameless plug, Abhishek. Shameless plug. Um, so are there any tools that you use that you wouldn't normally use just because you're distributed? That was another question that came in. Physical stand-ups? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just curious how people do whiteboarding the, with the remote teams. Does anyone here do whiteboarding with the remote teams? Yeah. What tool do you use? Sorry? Mirror? OK, Mirror. It used we, to be real time board. We have one big whiteboard, which is electronic, and that's the only one in the office. But we do that sometimes. It's weird. Yeah. Awesome. OK, uh, another question that came up, um, and you actually touched on co-location or meeting you know, every so often. But they said, is it important to have some co-located meetings for a fully distributed team? And if so, how often? And I know, Abhishek, you touched a little bit. And Kost, you touched a little bit. Who wants to go first? Yeah, uh, so we uh, follow the Scale Agile. It's a, it's a flavor of Agile uh, where we plan for three months um, and I'm not saying that the whole Twilio follows it, it's just my team follows it. We find it very productive. And 
what we bring is, is at the time of planning, we fly uh, all the teams together so that we can be in the one room, spent the whole week in the architectural whiteboarding, which is very critical as you're together, talk about all the issues and spend uh, you know, evenings socializing, building trust. Uh, so our cadence is once in three months right now. Yeah, for us, we used to have, whenever we had, uh, for example, engineering old white hands, uh, white all hands, which was every quarter, we would have everybody in the engineering come over. Uh, we've stopped doing that because it's really hard to ask so many people to actually have to fly over at the same time. Um, so we now, actually tomorrow, we're doing it the first distributed one. Uh, we have a company-wide one, um, basically an offsite for the whole company that everybody comes into one single place. Um, and then otherwise, like teams will do small things. So either um, people will come to San Francisco or, uh, for example, uh, Gabe, one of the injury managers in the back, his entire team went to Vancouver and worked from there for the week and worked with folks there as well. Yeah, and for Erica, you you know obviously you're a remote first company, right? So, uh, is there a cadence that you suggest? Are you trained on the kind of cadence? Uh, we try to meet at least once a quarter, but um, my team also participates a lot in conferences as well, and so we meet at uh, various conferences as well. Okay, okay. I also have a a little more exciting and potentially salacious question for all of you, and I'll let the panel decide who goes first. Uh, we had a question around how do you keep remote team members in the loop with spontaneous hallway conversations, water cooler talk. No one wants that one. <laughs> Definitely not a Slack channel. It sounds like uh, we instituted um, coffee time. Uh, about like 20 minutes uh, once a week to sort of drink coffee and chit chat about anything. And we're hoping that we'll sort of foster like a water cooler type talk. Yeah, we actually did. So we used Donut. That's one of the Slack things, which we'd used in San Francisco. And now we're trying it out in a distributed fashion where you basically can grab coffee with someone um, in a distributed way. Um, but in general, like I think the moment you start having majority of your team being distributed, it kind of takes away from your ability to even have those kind of conversations because it just doesn't happen as much. Uh, or if you have teams that are in different offices, then those teams will have those kind of conversations in the hallway. Um, but it's more isolated and it's less impacting across the board. For Twilio, I think there's a hallway conversation specifically in technology can be um, how to capture them can be very critical because sometimes really critical decisions just happen in the hallway where we are using, I don't know, Kafka versus Kinesis and nobody else knows. So we literally incorporate a value as part of the Twilio for all 3,000 employees, which is write it down. Uh, we can't write down all the communication in the hallway, but write down all the important decisions, specifically if you're, if you're the owner. And uh, that's a culture where we literally call it out, oh, good job on write it down. Um, that's that's one. Other than that, uh, it's we don't have any structure. We, uh, you know, the specific teams try to do the hackathon once in a week, and they all sit together in front of the Zoom as uh, coffee time. So, yeah. And Shannon, we talked about this before uh, this uh, meeting, but uh, a lot of Slack channels, a lot lots of Slack and channels. lots and lots of Slack channels, including including private ones. Yeah, how many people here have way too many Slack channels? Okay, okay. So, I mean, that does talk about efficacy, right, of Slack channels being a tool. So I assume all of you have processes around making sure that, you know, this actually drives innovation and communication as opposed to just having a billion Slack channels. Any tips and tricks around how to manage the Slack channel problem if you're remote? <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, I think, as a company, you can't really force people to do or not do things because they'll do them in private. Um, so I think you have to trust people to use it, to use their tools in a good way. Um, but in general, I think uh, having good norms that are consistent, in general, like, I think especially as you're stupid, it's really important to have like organizational interfaces. So how do I actually ask a question for a team? How do I actually submit a bug? How do I actually like ping someone? How do I find out who's on call, et cetera? Uh, and Slack, I think, plays a big part of that because, like, for us, for example, every team has a channel uh, where you can go and ask the team questions if you want, for example. Abhishek, Erica? So for me, I tell my engineering team, don't burn yourself up. So uh, make sure when you're out of the uh, office, you know, uh, snooze your Slack. Uh, I think the biggest thing what Slack can do in this age is burn everyone else down. Like, you know, we 
We are constantly on the phone. We are constantly checking all the chatters. And now the, all the Slack channels are integrated with other robo channels. Like if the build guy is going, the build is failing, deploying. We're all very distracted right now. So for me, I told my team, all is good. Don't basically you know, try to snooze. Try to take some rest at least for 10 to 12 hours a day. Don't look at the Slack when you're at least at home. Now, of course, there is no strong rule which is enforced, but that's my philosophy. <laughs> so I think we can start to have people. Yeah, did you want to? OK, so um, this is a really good opportunity for your folks to start sending in some questions. Oh, here we go. Uh, so I'll be asking some of the questions. If you see something that you're excited about, upvote, and I'll get to it. Um, if you think of something while we're discussing, please go ahead and submit your question, and folks will start to upvote. So the first question, um, oh, I like this one. Top three tactics for celebrating while remote. I'll let anyone take it. Slack channel, celebrate. We try to consolidate all the celebrations when we meet. Um, Uh, during our team sync with it, that we have weekly, uh, the first item is always like, what can we celebrate? Oh, nice. I think we have stuff around celebration for like individuals and groups um, of people that work on amazing things. Um, and we've also done like sending people cookies or cake or stuff like that. I want cookies. All right. Um, how do you evaluate candidates for async working capabilities? For Twilio, uh, as we have a value which is write it down, so that goes as part of your performance reviews. That goes as part of when we recruit candidates. We basically look for a couple of things, which is structured communication, uh, write it down. And that becomes more important as you go for senior roles or product management roles. Um, yeah, I would say in general, uh, if you're joining, you should have worked remotely. So if someone were to want to work remotely from the beginning and they've never done it before, so there's no way to actually get signal on that, uh, we typically ask them to spend six to 12 months in San Francisco or in a office uh, before they go and actually do remote and then they can kind of try it out. Um, so we don't promise that they can do that. Communication is very important. So we screen for that. Um, number two is um, empathy levels as well as a uh, very, um, we have a standardized uh, diversity and inclusion um, screening as well uh, to make sure that you could, you know, you're able to work with, you know, various cultures, you know, et cetera. Right. Um, and I, I feel like we've touched on this, so I think people are trying to dig a little bit deeper. Um, so how do you extend a feeling of team culture to new distributed locations instead of them feeling siloed or like they're just a satellite of the main HQ? I mean, do you have established kind of values that you tend to share and you know evaluate on or? Kaz, do you want to take this one? You've built out recently. Yeah, so I think, so for me, remote is someone that works from not in an office. So for example, if someone were to go, I don't know, in Dallas and work from Dallas, they're working remotely. Uh, if someone's working in our New York office, they are a distributed team program from the distributed office. Um, companies tend to do it in two ways. Either they have HQ and then they have satellite offices. Um, I think that's a bad idea. Or you have different nodes. Each node is an office. They have different sizes. Um, and everything is much more balanced. So it's not like, oh, in New York, we have like shitty teams and no one really wants to work there. And in SF is where the cool work is. Like, no, every office has like teams really distributed across the, the company. Um, and we build new teams all the time. And so if you're working there, it's mostly because it's more convenient for you, personal choices, et cetera, rather than because like you couldn't work on something else in the company. Yeah, for, for us, I think that's a great question, as we are just trying to build a team in Madrid, and that requires a lot of travel for me. That requires a lot of travel for the product manager. So pretty much, you have to spend the energy. You have to be there on the ground. Uh, the second is, uh, what kind of leader we have? As uh, Kohan was saying, you don't leave a bad work. You leave a bad manager. So we try to hire engineering managers in the remote location who can and successfully evangelize our mission, our values, who can successfully basically keep uh, folks motivated, excited, why we're we building this, what we're we building this. That's very important. And uh, um, 
Third thing is if we try our site leaders, uh, specifically one who can manage the whole site like India or Madrid, we try to have them, someone who worked in San Francisco office or worked in Twilio for a very long time, understand all the values and then want to migrate uh, to a different office. I think those, those practices work really well. Yeah, I like the evangelism and enabling your team to evangelize. That's good. Yeah, in fact, what Twilio do is that every site leader have their own budget and they can do uh, local activities because, you know, I'm pretty sure Madrid has their own festivals and India has its own thing. So we basically uh, specifically allocate budget to them and they can, you know, uh, run their whole cultural thing if they want. Right. Erica, did you want to add? Um, we tend to have a very open um, culture um, from before I started. So uh, things to be tends to be like very like open, but also um, during our, I tend to have um, one on ones uh, with my team, um, each person from my team, and I tell them that that time is for them. If they have any concerns, um, I would like for them to bring it up to me. So if they feel like you know siloed or they have any sort of concerns, um, I try to create an environment where they could you know talk to me about it. That's great. A lot of people kind of upclick this question. Is there any follow-up that anyone wants before I move on? Oh, great. Great job. Okay. Uh, this one's fun. Uh, do you stand up in your remote stand-ups? <laughs> I do. Yes. <laughs> Erica? Maybe. Sometimes? <laughs> I do. <laughs> How many people here stand up in the remote stand-ups? How many people absolutely refuse to stand up in their remote stand-ups? Ah, okay. Everyone Just out of principle. Does. I got gotcha. <laughs> you. That's a good point. Oh, so, uh, I'm sorry, what's your name? Oh, you're the guy. Okay, so he said people tend to speak less when they stand up. Hence the, only the question. Is if, you're, if you're taking the stand-up from your kitchen, as I've done that when I was managing Indian teams. So, yeah, you're standing in your kitchen, you're like, yeah, let's do the stand-up. <laughs> awesome. Um, one question now that's being uploaded is, so are junior developers distributed remote, do they require more tracking? And how do you not cross the micromanagement line? Erica? Uh, I think they do require more guidance, um, and so I we do our daily standups. We actually do the daily standups using Geekbot on Slack, um, and also we track our work using GitHub issues. Um, and when I see, I do have to sort of watch the amount of work that that person is doing uh, if they are a little more junior and if they are somehow lost, like they. You know, I, I do sort of check up on them um, to make sure things are moving along. I'm not really sure if they think, I'm not really sure if they think that I'm micromanaging. I, I don't think so. But well, you can ask them in your one on one. Yeah, I will ask in my one on one. Uh, Abhishek, Kost, do you want to touch on this, or do you want More me to us, like, uh, we, we try to hire, uh, if possible, Twilio is a big company, I know it may not be possible for everyone, but we try to hire managers uh, first, uh, so that you know they are on the ground and they can uh, coach and mentor junior employees. Um, that's, that's pretty much it for us. How many people here are worried that they're micromanaging? Hmm? Insecure about it? Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. It's hard to know what that line is. Gus, do you have any suggestions for them? No, I think he's been really, really good uh, in terms of, basically, I think there's the, the risk that you have with someone, whether they're in their office or not, about micromanaging them because they're more junior and need guidance. Uh, I think basically like 2x that once you start going, um, having them remote and you kind of, that's how you feel. Okay. Just to add on this question, I think one thing which worked very well for me is in your, how people run their 101. And in the one-on-one, basically, I'll ask uh, employers to structure, like, what are the questions you have, what are the agendas you have, and it widely vary who you're talking to. If you're a junior, basically, they're going to have questions. I was just having, you know, one today, which is like, oh, how should I grow in my career? In this case, it was a data scientist. And what are the specific things I should be doing? That actually just start the conversation in which 
I'm not pushing the information, which is micromanagement, but they are trying to pull the information from me, which, is, which I like it, actually. Yeah, and that feels like a very secure answer, where you've been doing this for a little while. I know when I first started managing, you tend to get a little bit nervous because you, you don't know. So um, what kind of, kind of distributed training or techniques can you give the folks out here that are a little nervous about micromanaging? Are there books they can read, processes they can follow, or is it just time? Uh, <laughs> or none of the above? <laughs> I, I think for me, it's all about the above, right? Books, time. Um, it's... Uh... It's, it, I think it's a, it's a transition, right? When you go from a developer to a manager and then manager to a director, and uh, it's, uh, how should I put it in a structured way? You, you have to let go of the things. You have to just form the trust, make sure you understand what you got hired for, what is engineering management. Is it about still writing 50% of the code or it is servant leadership? If it is servant leadership, how to basically think more about the team and less about you? And th those are the core principles. When when there is a mind shift happen here, you slowly realize that yes, to support teams, even seven people team is really time consuming all the time. Thinking ahead, make sure they're happy, make sure they're doing the right work and all that. And you get no time to code or even thinking, oh, what does your pull request mean here? Yeah, I think it's also how you think about your team because even if you have your team all in one city uh, or in one office, I. I'm most of the time in random meetings all the time, so it's not like I see my team members day in, day out, every hour. Um, so you have to trust them. You have to basically, like, here's the goals. You kind of measure those. So the fact that they're not literally in, on the same floor or in the same building or in the same city actually doesn't really make a difference. You kind of have to let go of that mindset, um, and then it just works. Right. And it sounds like we have one more, and then we'll break out. OK. I like this one. Uh, Someone was asking, can pair programming work with distributed teams, and what's the max time zone difference to make it work? You want to take it away? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Erica. Time zone difference to make it work. Yeah. Uh, we have done pair programming. It depends on where the other person is. Uh, we've done pair programming where the person is in Europe. That tends to happen like earlier in the mornings. Um, whereas like I've, we've done pair programming with someone in Asia and that tends to be later in the day. Um, and I think there are tools now to sort of enable pair programming um, available. Um, so, sorry, yes, use them. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much for answering all these questions. Please give them a round of applause.